one, two, three, tape number two, tape number two, beginning of the Polish Institute, beginning of the Polish Institute by Felix Cross, July 1989, dictated at Islesford, Cranberry Island, in Maine. I, ha I have to change a little bit the ending sentences uh, of the first tape, <coughs> where I started to talk about Chehanovsky. <coughs> Let me start now differently. But talking about the Beginning Institute, we cannot limit ourselves only to this group of scholars, very prominent ones who are associated with the Polish Academy of Sciences and with Polish universities. Because the, Aca the Polish Institute was formed not only from the members of the Polish Academy of Sciences, but also in part from the members of the Polish Academy of Letters, to which belonged uh, Jan Lechoń, the poet. I am not quite sure, but anyhow, he was the member of Joseph Witlin, Kazimierz Wierzyński, Julian Tuwim. I don't know whether he was or not, but belonged to this group of prominent poets. I mention only a few. But that is the second group. The third group are various Polish prominent intellectuals or men of politics, directly not connected with academic life, and then, of course, the very crucial group of American friends who helped to bring the Institute immediately into the center of academic interest in humanities and history. <clears throat> they made out of the Institute a rather prominent institution and you can find out it easily from the first issue of the bulletin where you have the names of the Americans who did support us. But let's go to our poets and writers. <clears throat> Unlike the professorial group, there was no caste feeling whatsoever. There was no clannishness among them. This was an extremely friendly, direct group, completely free of any consciousness of status or any arrogance of greatness, nothing of it. To the contrary, when you came to the Institute and met them, so you knew they are very prominent, talented, knowledgeable, it was a pleasure. They were so direct, so friendly, and so witty above all. Very witty, very human, and very humane. And here belongs also Czermański, the painter, and the other painters, which I cannot mention, but the Gisław Czermański, <coughs> unusually witty, and uh, all those men of a character, of a personal character and moral strength, I must say. I would say the weakest in this respect among them was Tuvim, uh, who had his hesitation always, but he was the same way very pleasant, direct, and friendly, uh, never with his nose up, never stressing his great poetry, not even mentioning that he writes. Even in those difficult times, they did not show any greed for money. It was striking this modesty and uh, simplicity of those men. I remember Czermański, who needed money, he was a great painter. He painted for London Illustrated News, for Fortune magazine, for others. Once we were somewhere on an outing, 
in Caskill Mountains in Hunter, sitting under the tree and he was telling me all kind of jokes from Krakow, jokes from the football, soccer games, he collected very carefully. And here came a obviously very well-to-do person looking down at us and he said in Polish, Panie Czarmejski, Pan namaluje mój portret, a ja Panu dobrze zapłacę. I said, Mr. Czarmejski, you paint my portrait and I will pay you well. Czarmejski looked up because we were sitting under the tree and the man looked at him, looked at his left and right and then say slowly, nie widzę powodu, I don't see any reason. <laughs> Those were independent people. <clears throat> would like also to mention that there was no hostility among them. The usual hostility among writers and poets which grows out of competition. They were very close friends, they used to meet in the institute, all of them, and later, very much later, when there was a problem of Miłosz's coming to, Paul, to the United States, I think it was Joseph Wittlin who said to me, without any hesitation, Miłosz is the greatest poet of Poland of this century, far greater than any of us. Uh, that is something to say. He, Wittlin was a very prominent poet, so was Lechoni, of course. And to tell about a man who was far younger that way and recognize his greatness, it struck me in a very positive way. And also when uh, Miłosz was, had problems in coming to the United States, those men very, very much supported him and didn't have any doubts and hesitation that he should be held, in spite of the fact that many others in the immigration were opposed to it. But that is a special chapter which may interest Professor Blyv, as I know, is a part of intellectual history. Well, I shall not dwell on this group any longer, so it deserves much more than what I say. <clears throat> I will move to next one. Here belong a group of political men and of unofficial position and those who did not have the official positions at this time. In the United States, I would like to mention above all Jan Ciechanowski, to whom I spoke about the Polish Institute, the Polish ambassador, a man who was conservative, not reactionary, conservative in the British sense, very intelligent, and in terms of politics, he was a real statesman. He impressed me as a diplomat and men of politics in the conversation we used to have in his anticipation, his evaluation of the situation. He was far above the level, the diplomatic level, which I have encountered before. He was of a timber of a statesman. He supported very much the Institute and uh, the idea of the Institute was very friendly. So was Sylvin Strakac, <clears throat> the Polish minister in New York, a friend and secretary of Paderewski and very close to General Sikorski. Period. It was very important to have his support. Now let me mention that at this time 
The Polish government, as you know, has changed, and the government of exile was headed by General Sikorski, and it was a new group, which uh, was in the opposition to the regime, which was a kind of mild dictatorship, but still dictatorship in Poland for years. This group came now to power, and General Sikorski personally was very much trusted in the West. Now, uh, let me mention that in the embassies and consulates, the staff was mostly appointed still by the old regime. And there were few people on whom Sikorsky could really count, and the new government in exile. Jan Ciechanowski was one of them. It was Sikorsky's man, so was Strakac, because Sikorsky was connected with Paderewski. Now, let me make a small digression here, <clears throat> and then I will return to it. Uh, Paul, you forgive that there are so many digressions, but I sometimes think about my conversation and reading some of the material of Professor Blaivas and begin to think that perhaps it is time for an intellectual history of the migration. We always write the ethnic history in terms of economic problems rather than cultural. But uh, this was a cultural milieu, a quite interesting, very lively, not inferior, the, the best in the West. Now let's come back to it <clears throat> with a personal note. Already before the war, I belonged to a small group which was connected with General Sikorsky's headquarters in Switzerland and in Paris, so-called Front Morsch. Front Morsch, it was a centrist democratic front opposed to the Kornos and to the dictatorial regime. I was not directly member of this. Front Morsch was more to the center, a little bit to the right more. But <clears throat> with this group, which in reality the moral head of it was Paderewski and Sikorski, in Poland itself, his uh, man of trust was the rector of the University of Krakow, a striker, Stanisław, with whom I was very close, and my personal friend, his son, Karl Estreicher. And we had a small seminar. It was... Uh, Major Tokas, who was one time at the count of General Sikorski, Pat Kanioski, later dean of the University of Krakow, my colleague in history of law, Józef Krzyżanowski, myself, headed by Rector Estreicher. We all had very similar political ideas as far as democracy is concerned, and the regime in power at this time. <coughs> in Poland. And General Sikorski knew about me from Xaveri Pruszyński, from Karol Estreicher in London. And uh, I had... He was very friendly, I would like to say. I mentioned that also because later I had to play a certain part in formation of the Institute, in organization of the Institute where any support in London was relevant. Now let's go to the main topic. In this informal group, I would like to mention above all Roman Michałowski, 
Colonel Roman Michalowski, who later served in the United States Army, who was one time military attaché in London. He was at the camp of Marshal Piłsudski during the First World War. A highly educated and civilized civil person, very friendly very friendly and sincere, also with unusual political acumen. Roman Michalowski, coming from an aristocratic family, belonged to a family which has established in Rome the Polish library and supported it, similar to the Polish library in Paris, <clears throat> and his uncle was in charge of it. They had tradition, the Michałowskis, of assisting, helping cultural work of this type. He considered it as a very important. At this time he was very friendly with Ludwig Krzyżanowski. They both were editors of New Europe, a monthly review of international affairs dedicated especially to post-war planning. Michałowski advice was important, but also he had a word in the Allied circle and in certain American groups. He was very friendly with General Bukema, an ape Lincoln who were teaching at this time both professors at West Point. <clears throat> Michałowski worked with them for a time and uh, on the other hand he was very, he had very good relation with the British uh, and with the French. He became later deputy director of the Inter-Allied Information Center, which was really a central organization of the pre-United Nations. Uh, and he got there without any support from the Polish government in London of Sikorsky because he belonged to the old group. He belonged to the Piłsudski group and they wouldn't give him the support. Later, when the problem of the agreement of the government of exile came uh, to the focus, uh, Michałowski had to leave and he joined the United States Army. But that is a special story which I will tell one time. He was a very honorable man, by the way. Michałowski supported very much any idea of, of this type. And now, last not least, comes the most important group, the American group, the American scholars. There were individuals among American scholars who were very sympathetic to the Polish cause. I shall mention here, for instance, just as an example, Robert, Robert McEver, the well-known sociologist at Columbia University, uh, who was also informed and listened to Ted Abel, whom he appointed to the faculty of the University of Columbia, Ted Abel, the very well-known sociologist. Also, Abel was not a key person in the establishment of the Institute. You will find many names uh, of those friends in the bulletin of the Polish Institute. I would like, however, to 
indicate here that the key person in contact with uh, world scholars, if I may say so, with the scholars <clears throat> in America and in England, was of course Bronisław Malinowski, who had already at this time a worldwide reputation as an anthropologist. And he was a British anthropologist. And uh, he could very much assist and help the development of such an institution. I was at this time young, but had some possibilities, at least, to say a kind word, which was needed In my young years, I had a scholarship in Paris of the Carnegie, Carnegie Endowment for Peace. And hence, <clears throat> after I arrived to the United States, I was able to establish very good relations, especially with Malcolm Davis, director of the institution. and. <clears throat> and the prominent historian and president of the endowment, Professor James Shotwell. In reality, they are very friendly and supportive. And I saw them quite frequently in the headquarters of the Carnegie Endowment, <clears throat> which, by the way, was there where this now international building of Columbia University, this very tall one is. The foundation was in an old brownstone house. James Shotwell is a very prominent historian. His History of Histories is still a classic book. Then, not long after my arrival, Philip Mosley, later very well known Russian historian, got in touch with me, asking to prepare a paper on post-war organization of Europe and post-war plans. As I see that, and as I think some of the democratic groups in Poland would see that, it was after I came from Poland. I wrote the paper <clears throat> for the Council on Foreign Relations. He was connected at this time. He was editor of Foreign Affairs. And this was, I discovered later, for Hamilton Fish Armstrong, who worked on the project. Uh, this paper is still there. I have forgotten about it. But uh, about eight years ago, Professor Walt, late Professor Walter Libgens uh, from the European Institute in Florence <clears throat> and uh, from the University of Saar was looking for early sources on European organization. And, and he found this paper and brought it to me. So that was the first money, by the way, I earned. American money, it was $50, Philip Bosley arranged for me, for the paper, and then I got $600 from the Herald Tribune for an article, which was lots of money. I had to share it with one of the editors. <clears throat> but I had my contacts at least, not to say contacts, but the ear and conversations with Phil Mosley, who directly was connected with the Council on Foreign Relations and with the Carnegie Endowment, nothing to say about the context in the new leader and the labors, exile labor circles and American labor movement with which I was very close at this time. <clears throat> 